Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. That was my granddaughter exercising just one of her many gifts. So, thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time. Now, the peace challenge has, has culminated, we said, July and August. This is now September 1st. So we're, but to, the good news is the challenge may have ended, but God's peace goes on forever. Yep. So it's forever available, so that doesn't mean stop. <laughs> um, but I think there's a, a new challenge. And I think, you know, one of the... We ought to start this, the love challenge. And yeah. I was reading over some of the, uh, uh, some of the questions in the, in the children's thing that J- uh, Jason and Gwen did. It's like, can you think of anybody that you could give a gift to? Do you think of anybody that really you could make them happy? Do you think of anybody who has made you happy lately? Has there, you know, these are questions for children's emotional health, you know, things are, those are good things to think about, you know. So, whatsoever things are pure, lovely, think on these things. So, guess what? Today's another day we can love God. That's the way to wake up in the morning. It will change your focus. Otherwise, you wake up and, and the to-do list rises to the surface first, right? Uh, no, no. This is another day to love God in the midst of the to-do list and whatever. So uh, today's message is keeping the main thing the main thing. I kind of hit on this in some previous messages, but I'll tell you what, it's the main thing is the main thing. And I learned early on is that there's so many good things you can do in the body of Christ based on your gifts, motivational gifts and spiritual gifts, Uh, but you can get off-center with something good. I have saw people that got teaching-centered, evangelism-centered. And you know, if it's not Christ-centered, you get, you get off a little bit, and it's tricky because it sounds like all good stuff. You can get healing-centered. One of the things is we are, I believe, uh, specifically over the years, clearly known in the bo- larger body of Christ, we are known as people that could bring emotional healing quite easily, as well as deliverance. Uh, when you learn how to do emotional healing in closed doors, that is. Um, And in the process of all of that, I said, but you know what? I want to teach and train people the way God taught me that what makes it effective is doing the main thing and keeping the main thing the main thing. Otherwise, you get sidetracked. Uh, I saw people that struggled with emotional healing, and it was like there's no reason for that until I realized what they were doing was the minute they'd go into prayer, they'd be digging around for something's wrong. Well, what's wrong with me now? What's a... Instead, for me, it was a matter of a few minutes a day dealing with stuff. The majority of the time was enjoying God. The majority of your prayer time should be connecting with God, spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. And then say, God, in this love relationship that I have with you, from the place of peace, from the place of, of, of uh, communion, then say, God, search me, oh God, for secret faults, anything. That's, I'm not going to make labor at this thing. Dead works are dead works. I don't care what, what, what the procedure is that you're into at the point in time, whether it's evangelism or teaching or counseling or whatever. If you're working too hard at it, that's not God. And one of the most important things to learn as a Christian is initiative, promptings, quickenings, to where God is actually saying, ah, here's a scripture. Ah. 
that's his prompting. I have no doubt whatsoever that promptings that come from God, God's initiative, produces the promise. We're to marinate in God reality. You're going to hear this. Most of the church can memorize this. If you're watching by YouTube, you need to memorize this too. Uh, marinate in God reality. God reality requires spirit to spirit relationship. Marinate in God reality. God initiative. How do I marinate in God's initiative? Well, you get your antsiness under the authority of the Holy Spirit. You sit still until your flesh weakens and the spirit strengthens. He wants a rule. Then, then I trust your God initiative. Then I trust I feel led. Or I have a burden. I don't trust any of that until I know that it's coming from God initiative and not my good idea. Even if it sounds really spiritual. You'll never know that apart from a relationship with reality divine initiative, and then guess what happens after divine initiative? Provision. Because if it's God's initiating the prayer, if God's initiating it, it comes to pass. So I think a lot of people are wasting their time saying, how come I pray for this and I pray for that? And I, but because it was you, the independent you, you weren't even connected to God, you are just asking for all kinds of good things that you thought you needed. And I'm so grateful that in those early years when God said, I'm going to take you to the school of the Spirit, the one thing I didn't do is I, I don't recall praying for stuff. I prayed for Him. And He is my provision, so any specificity will come out of that relationship. Now, the main points of the Bible, the main keeping the main thing the main thing is today's message. Um, uh, I once had a person that visited the church some time ago and they said I noticed he preaches out of his experience I don't want to preach out of anything other than my experience I can use other people's statements and com uh, comments and different ways of saying the same thing but if it's not real to me I, you're not going to hear it here I want a reality I want something that the spirit made real to me not just concepts or the theory there's a lot of theories out there but here's the main point of the Bible. To know God, I'll give you four points real quick. Point number one, to know God, you have to exercise your spirit. Remember we talked about it, that's the proper organ. You can't exercise your spirit and know God with your head. It's the wrong organ. Spirit to spirit. The second thing is, and this is the main thing, the main thing is, is that you have to use your spirit, not your head. The head learns from the spirit. But our spirit is joined together with him. How many times in this church you've heard the scripture, they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. That You need that one spirit with him concept because everything that's accomplished is not coming from your independent self or your good ideas or your likes or your dislikes. It's coming from that union. Every good thing comes from that union. So the second thing is our spirit is mingled or joined to God's spirit. That's what we call the new creation, or they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit. The third thing is understanding the blood, that the blood produced, the shedding blood of Jesus produced the forgiveness of sin. And a forgiveness lifestyle is eminent if you want to call this a love challenge because forgiveness is where the love, where the rubber meets the road, the love commandment. And what is the love commandment? What is, what, what is obeying God's commandments but to love God and love one another? You can't skip that and then do a bunch of religious stuff. You'll find yourself worn out, wanting to quit, discouraged. But God's saying the main thing, if you do the main thing, those other things fall into place. Even the things that you would normally, uh, uh, what I love to watch is the people that have been trained and, and properly discipled in this, uh, when they go through hard times, things that would have crushed somebody else become irritations and obstacles to overcome. That's a sign of spiritual growth. That's a sign that God is doing something. So the blood is for forgiveness. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Christ 
cleanses you continually. So walk a forgiveness lifestyle and be quick to do it. Don't say, well, well, after I think about it for a while. While you're thinking about it for a while, you're fortifying the enemy's foothold in your life and he will torment. But he needs permission. That's the one beautiful thing about, about the body of Christ is that there's, there's, a, there's a safety uh, in the relationship both individually and corporately if you apply it. You don't have to get beat up. He says, uh, you know, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I have removed this ability. I like the message trailer. I've removed this ability to harm you. So it's not saying it doesn't happen. It's saying I've removed this ability to harm you. That's a positive step. So not only do we have on that third uh, point uh, the blood of forgiveness, but we've got the cross for self. Oh, yeah. You know how much misery we've seen in, in the Christian church of that independent self with a good idea. You know, you're not General Motors. You do not have a better idea. All right? Not than God. His ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Humble that self and get God's thoughts. As a matter of fact, when I said I didn't ask for things now, when God was discipling me in the early days, I did, I did pray and believe that any quickening, any scripture, anything that came, that was God's prayer request. I prayed his prayer request. There's a big difference between praying God's prayer request and you have not because you ask not. You ask and you don't receive because yeah, it's your own lust. It's, you just want to consume it. You, I, I want this for me. You don't know what you want. You need to relinquish yourself because you don't see clearly. But God sees everything. Learn to trust in Him. The fourth element is that when you learn to take up your cross, or let the cross deal with self so that He doesn't fly off independent. You know, I, I saw more people confused with that word you. We say this all the time. You. The independent self can do nothing. Apart from him, you can do nothing. You know what you he's talking about, right? That's the you that thinks it's smarter and has a better idea or doesn't need God. But you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's a different you, isn't it? That's the one mingled together, joined together, one spirit together with him, and it's a co-laboring, and you're doing it from your spirit. It's your spirit and God's spirit together doing it. I still remember, uh, uh, she's with the Lord now, but uh, she was an adjunct professor at uh, Yale. And she, she, her revelation was, what you're talking about forgiveness, that, that you need to forgive because the Bible says so, but God is the only one that can forgive sin. So you, it's both of you doing the forgiveness, letting God go to the pain. And so he takes away your guilt and shame. We sang about it this morning. He's the only one that can take away your guilt and shame. All you do is suppress it. But he, she said, this suggests that if it's no longer I who live, then it's no longer I who love. That also suggests it's no longer I who forgive. But it's going to be Christ in me. For it is God who is at work to will and to perform. We need to have a concept of we. We're going to pray, I believe, at the end for that. Graduate up from the child who's got the gimmies and expects God to be this uh, uh, vending machine in heaven that just takes care of you. You want to be taken care of, you submit to him, and you submit to his lordship, and he will care for you. Now, but you don't boss him around. <laughs> it doesn't work well. I remember when the, uh, a young lady was just a child. She went to her grandma and said, you're not the boss of me. And she goes, oh, yes, I am. Oh. <laughs> it's funny how you, I think Christians need to realize that. You may... Don't be poking God in the eyes saying, you ain't the boss of me. That's a hard road to travel. I love, the, I love in the Didache the way uh, Jewish disciples of Jesus, this is after Jesus arose, ascended to the heaven, his disciples had to teach Gentiles, clueless people. Do you know any clueless people? 
there's a there's a few around somewhere if, if you look in the right places. But these clueless people came, and the lesson number one from these apostles who were with Jesus, they lived with him, they touched him, they held him, they heard him, and they're fellowshipping with him still, even after he ascended. That's spirit to spirit. They're still, and that their joy is full and. Uh, what did they say to these Gentiles? There's two roads. There's a road to life and a road to death. Great is the chasm between the two. See, you know, too much gray. We have too much gray, but they broke that right away. So much for many ways to God. Because I'm sure some of them raised, well, what about Buddha? What about, what about it? What about, what about? And go, two roads. <laughs> life and death and great is the chasm between the two. You got a lot of gray areas, you're probably following the chasm. Now, this fourth element of is what we would call life joy. That's my favorite thing in the Amplified Bible is a makarios is the Greek word for blessed, happy, with life joy that is enviable. We want to go there, don't you? I want the real thing. I want reality. I don't want church. I don't want, rea I don't want religion in the context of just duty and works, you know, and being basically a good person. <laughs> you could do that without Jesus, couldn't you? So what he's looking for is the eternal life, the Zoe kind of life in the spirit. Now, uh, keeping the main thing the main thing, this eternal life or this Zoe life or this life joy that makes one enviable. It's the, it's the Zoe is life in the spirit, not biological life, but spiritual life. And God only builds with spiritual life. He can't build with wood, hay, and stubble. And a lot of people are building ministries and churches and their own life out of wood, hay, and stubble. That's not what God's looking for. God's saying, you build with quality material because you want to be living stones. You want to be precious stones. You want to be a, a, a habitation of God in the spirit to where my divine nature is in you and ex being exhibited through you. So now there's wonderful concepts apart from these main points, from knowing God and exercising your spirit being mingled together, joined together, the blood of forgiveness, which is made so available, it never ends, and the cross to self, taking self and saying, you know what, I do not function independent of God. If God doesn't give me the, the insight, I'm not, I'm not going to go with some of my good ideas. Now, the peripheral points, and this is important, especially for uh, as a pastor seeing people hurting in the church. And there's so many that really could have been helped, but they don't really want to listen. They have their own idea and concepts and thoughts. But in reality, there is comfort in suffering in the scriptures. But the comfort in suffering must come from the comforter himself, not some false comfort. Otherwise, we all should just be on drugs. Oh, I did drugs before I got saved. I'll tell you what, the comfort of the Holy Spirit is a real thing, and there's no... There's no craving and no crash, no crash down from the, from the high. So, I mean, it's, to me, it's a simple choice. It's like, yes, there's suffering in this world, but there's a comforter that says, I've removed its ability to harm you. I've overcome. In this world, you'll have tribulation, but I've overcome. I want the comfort that comes from the Holy Spirit in difficult times. I want the real thing. And morality. I've seen people working so hard. Uh, someone say, I tried to do the 60-day challenge, but it's hard. And I, if it's hard, there's too much of you involved in it because it's actually quite simple. It requires a humility, and you're working too hard at it. The one thing that the Lord taught me was like, like I would pray through all of the garbage that was in my life to make sure there was no roots that would spring up and cause trouble. I did like David, search me, O oh God, for secret faults. I mean, secret from me. Because this non-conscious realm is infinite compared to what I know in the natural. It's like a little 
knowledge is like a little speck. The non-conscious is like the universe itself. That's how big a difference it is. So you aren't smart enough to search yourself. Ask God to search your heart for anxious thoughts, hurtful ways. Search me for secret faults. Because when you do that, then, then, then there's a transformation that takes place in the morality that you're seeking is not just being good, not just, well, I didn't kill anybody. You know, I, <laughs> there's people that are actually pretty proud of their morality and don't even know God. So, you know, these things are important, but get it the right way. And guidance for relationships, how to raise your children, how to, how to, how to relate at work with unsaved people and saved people, how to deal husband and wife relationships. They need to call Jason and Gwen, is what they need to do. But, but in reality, you know what? The atmosphere where children are in the presence of healthy children creates an environment that causes healing to come. And you're giving, you're giving children a visual to learn from, not just lifestyle, not just information. And um, so I'm going to start with um, <clears throat> uh, my main thing. If, if this worked for me, it works for anybody. My main thing, and I want to keep the main thing the main thing. Everything that's written, everything that we've published, everything came out of my main thing. But I don't apologize for it because it's so neutral. Anybody could do this if they wanted to. There has to be a want to somewhere, though. All right? Mine was Philippians 3.10. Written in my first Bible as a baby Christian. For my determined purpose, this was my main thing, just like the scripture says, for my determined purpose is. This is uh, Philippians 3.10 and he amplified. For my determined purpose is that I might know him. That was prayer for me. Close your eyes, quiet that noisy flesh that wants to get up and do something, say something, walk around, pray in tongues, do something. Not that any of that's wrong, but if it's an activity is replacing presence in God, then it's, you're not really helping yourself. It's you in charge again, doing. You're a human being, not a human doing. And I wanted to, in him, we live and move and have our being. And out of that being, the doing comes anointed. All of the doing then is, is coming under the, the directive of God. No. Philippians 3 tenths for my determined purpose is that I might know him, that I might progressively, so I know there's a progression here, it's not all instant, that I might progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that in that same way I'd come to know the power that's outflowing from that resurrection life, that Zoe life that we talked about. <sighs> even into the lightness of his death. And that death is to self. That death allows resurrection life to come forward. Romans 8.11 tells us that if the spirit of, whom, of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will also restore life to your mortal body. Now, I've used the scriptures uh, Paul himself used, but... Uh, that's the way God trained me for my determined purposes that I might know him. And I'll, I'll explain how it even developed over the years is that I would, I would stay in his presence until there was a character attribute or name of God. You know, there's a lot of names of God. You go to Bible school, they'll teach you the names of God. But until one of those emerged, I would embrace it until I owned it, until I could express it, till I could say it's my experience that I know him as El Shaddai. I know him as my shepherd. I know him as my uh, Lord. I know him as my creator God. I know him as my covenant making. And you walk in these relationships because that's what he quickened. I didn't pick and choose. He quickened it. That I might know him. That I might become more intimately acquainted with the wonders of his person. But then guess what? He reveals himself to whosoever. 
So, I'm a whosoever, so I said, reveal yourself to me. But I went in the order that he revealed to me, not me picking and choosing what I think I want. The second aspect of that main thing, that lasted to this day, that I might know him. And that probably took the place of a lot of prayer requests for me. Because there was my prayer request. If, if I hit on something that was quickened from the scripture, that's what I wanted. That was my prayer request. I want to pray his prayer request too. And if there was any indication that what he was trying to teach me or train me would benefit someone else, then that's what I wanted to pray for them. The second main thing would have been, what was God's main thing? If that was my main thing in God, that I might know him that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with him and, all, and learning all the names and attributes of God, not for head knowledge, but for a relationship to own it, for reality, to marinate in the reality of it. Now, God's main thing was, listen, this, now, this is Paul telling his life, but this was for me, and it's for you too. It's for everybody. This, he's not a respecter of persons. God separated me from my mother's womb. I got news for you. You are all separated from your mother's womb or you wouldn't be here. Right? It's true. But the purpose, God's main thing was to reveal his son in you. Oh, so God's main thing was, my main thing was to pursue him. His main thing was to reveal his son in me. Am I, am I trying to do that in my main thing? that I might know him, that I might progress? Am I doing what, am I cooperating with my main thing, cooperating with his main thing? Because his main thing was to reveal his son in me. That I might preach, proclaim, and express, and witness. Everybody's not called to preach. I was. But you are all called to proclaim, to express, to witness. So therefore, this applies to absolutely everybody. God's main thing for you is to be an expression of what has worked in you. Christ in you. Being expressed. Galatians 1.15 But when, when he who had chosen and set me apart, even before I was born, oh, this is the part I love the most. Even before I was born, he called me by his grace. To reveal, to unveil, to disclose his son within me so that I might proclaim him to the Gentiles. You can't proclaim something you don't have. But here's the part that amazes me that to me should challenge the church. It should challenge everyone listening to this message and even friends that you know that are not saved yet. All right. The transformation that needs to take place here is that God is saying... Before you were born. You know, old Paul, Paul was a mature adult when all of a sudden. How many of you got saved after you were a mature adult? How many backslidden and came back to the Lord after you were a mature adult? Guess what? It's not too late. Isn't that the good news? It's not too late. But... Finally in your life enter into that which God had planned for you before the foundation of the earth. Now, I'm sure Paul was a brilliant man. He was a scholar and everything, but he didn't catch on until he met Jesus. Guess what? There's a whole lot of brilliant people out there that haven't caught on yet because they haven't really met Jesus in reality. They might have some religion. They might go to church. Who knows what they do? I don't have a lot of confidence in everyone that calls themselves a Christian. I want to know. Are you expressing Jesus in reality? Because it's just a name. I learned that in politics. You can, you can be a Republican or a Democrat in name only. Right? Not, not believe anything that they stand for. So, uh, God's saying, he separated me from my mother's womb. He separated you from your mother's womb. And there's people that are not saved yet that guess what? They were separated from his mother's womb that God would have revealed Jesus in them. We're going to see an awakening take place in the body of Christ and you're going to see a lot of people, even like me, I had Christians tell me, you are such a hopeless case that we didn't even pray for you. <laughs> Is that bad or what? Were they wrong? Yeah. So don't you be wrong. Father, right now we pray for all those so-called hopeless cases. 
because before they were formed in their mother's womb, they were called to express Jesus, to decree, declare, and witness him. Before they were formed in their mother's womb. I think it's about time we entered into God's plan and, and, and really, you want to take up your cross, die to all your ideas and simply say, I want a God idea and I want it to know that I know that it's being prompted. The initiation is coming from God. The quickening is coming from God. I still remember that time. I'm learning this stuff. And you know, people pray for all kinds of crazy things. But you know what? I would have never had the smarts to pray for some of the best things that God ever did in my life. I'd have never, I wouldn't have known to do it. I got a scripture once in Jeremiah. Tarry seven days and I'll show you what I want you to do. And it had life on it. So I go, I want to tarry seven days. I have no idea what for. I will show you. Duh. <laughs> How many people are even willing to wait to jump to conclusions? They'll fill in the blanks. That's what people do when they don't know something. They just fill in the blanks with an opinion. <laughs> so I'm going to tarry seven days. So I said, I'm going to fast and pray seven days. That had life on it. That was my Jesus. I am clueless as to what it means. Well, at the, uh, near the end of the seven days, God says, write a book. And it flashed totally caught me off guard. I'm going, so I started looking into, this must have been about the third day into the fast, I guess, I'm guessing. And uh, I, I saw there was this local publisher that would do self-publication, but it was $10,000 for an initial printing. I'm going, oh, I don't have no $10,000. But God said, oh, well, I'm just going to continue fasting for the seven days. The seven days aren't up. There was a relative that was afraid that I wasn't eating. What? Why is he not eating? He's fasting and praying to God. Oh, he's not eating seven days? What, what for? Well, he's supposed to write a book, but it costs like $10,000. I'll give him the $10,000, tell him to eat. <laughs> now you tell me with all your brilliance, how would you have known to please God that way? I think what I'll do is I'll call a relative and tell him I'm not going to eat. Well, that, that'd be witchcraft, wouldn't it? I'm not going to eat until you, give, you fork over $10,000 so I can write a book. That the, God don't work that way, but you know what? Christians work that way. Hmm? Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Anything else manipulative is of the devil, no matter how clever you think it is. No. So my main thing was that I might know him. His main thing was that he separated me from my mother's womb. So I'm going, well, I, I, I was an adult by the time I got saved. So, you know, I got time to make up for it. God had this plan for me long before I was even in my mother's womb. <clears throat> now, listen to what he said. Now, we, we know Paul saying that <clears throat> for this purpose, God called me to preach. But look what happened. In God's main thing, in Acts 26, 14, he appeared to Paul who was doing all the wrong stuff. <laughs> he was persecuting Christians. And he was zealous. Oh, I've seen people zealous totally in the flesh. <laughs> it's called that dead works. And in that zeal, he was he was persecuting them Christians who are coming against us. And then it says, he appeared with the purpose. What was God appearing to him for a purpose? This is kind of like my book only on a much bigger scale. It's like he wasn't expecting this. He wasn't praying for this. He wasn't asking for this, was he? He was busy doing his own thing. He was persecuting those Christians. Sounds like a good idea if you're a religious leader. It was a good idea to him. Obviously, he had a zeal for it. <clears throat> and Jesus said to him, and when all had fallen to the ground, well, that ought to get your attention. I heard a voice speaking to me saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, 
For I have appeared to you, here we go, we're back to purpose. I appeared to you for this purpose. This is your purpose as well as my purpose, everybody's purpose. This is not just Paul. This follows the main thing. God's main thing needs to be the main thing. And that you might know him, that he separated you from your mother's womb to be an expression of him, not a bunch of ideas, not your gift. Isn't that, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? Depart from me, I knew you not. What's that say? He wants the relationship more than he wants your thing. Now, this purpose, this voice said, Rise and stand on your feet. He's speaking to you right now. And if you're watching by uh, YouTube, he's speaking to you right now to rise, stand to your feet. And he says, for this purpose. Matter of fact, you know what? That'd be a good thing to do right here. Just stand up to your feet. And say, I'm going to honor that word. Because I believe God called everybody to stand their feet. Stand to your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose. I am decreeing and declaring to you for this purpose to make you a minister. Yes, every one of you. you may not all be pastors, apostles, prophets, or teachers, but you are all ministers of the gospel. To equip the saints to do the work of the ministry is what fivefold ministry does. To make you a minister and witness both of the things which you have seen, the things that I will yet show to you. You may be seated. The things that you have seen. So that means as a believer now, you are committed to do the things that God showed you, but guess what? He's not done yet. He's going to show you more things in the future. I don't care how long you've been a Christian, short or long. You haven't arrived yet, and you haven't seen everything that he wants to show you. And he has shown you things in the past. And, and, and if you really honor God and are grateful, you've marked, you've marked those things as la uh, landmarks. Of, of strategic uh, change in your life. Well, he says, I'm not done. I want you to know that I will yet reveal to you. I will yet reveal to you. I will yet re If he could wait until you sowed wild oats for years and years and years and then get a hold of your heart, there's some stuff he's still got yet to reveal. You've got some catching up to do, right? You can't make it happen, but you can humble yourself and allow God to bring it to pass. So, Father, right now we repent as a people to think that we've arrived or we know all there is to know. We know nothing compared to the excellency of him who raised Jesus from the dead, wants to quicken and give life to our mortal body. He wants to give that Zoe kind of life that we would reveal his son in me, that we would be an expression of the reality, not theory. So, Father, I thank you for that voice from heaven, for the Apostle Paul and for all of us, because you appeared to us for this purpose. We got saved for this purpose. And that is key. All right? Now we're still on the main thing. So what is the church's main thing? According to Matthew uh, 16, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of this, the law of first mention. It's usually whenever a topic is mentioned for the first time in the Bible, it's significant. The first time church is mentioned in, in the uh, New Testament is in Matthew, Matthew 16. And, and there's some points here that to me are very important to understand. It says, uh, the, the, the questions that, that Jesus asked reveal to me the structure of church, corporate church. And, and uh, Matthew 16 says, when Jesus came into the region of Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? They said, some say you're John the Baptist, some others say you're Elijah, some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? There's, there's question number one. Who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are Messiah, the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. See, it's a revelation. He was revealed to him. He might not have even been expecting it, but it happened. Paul wasn't expecting to fall off his horse, but it happened. <laughs> All right. I will give you the keys of the, uh, upon this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Who do you say that I am? I, I believe there's, I'm going to cover real quickly seven 
seven points if you're one of those note takers. But the first thing is, who do you say that I am? Number one, if this is the, based on the law first mentioned, the church, the ecclesia. By the way, you're not a church by yourself. That's, uh, that's in the body all over the place, but that's people who are operating in their independent self, making an excuse for themselves. Like me and God, surfboard Christians, we used to call them back in the 70s. You know, I don't need to go to church. I'm on my surfboard, just me and God. You know, uh, you need a wave. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but who do you say that I am? Intimate knowledge of Jesus is the first qualification for ecclesia. If you're going to be part of the church, you're going to have intimate knowledge of church. There's unsaved people that go inside of a building and say they go to church, but they are not the church. You need intimate knowledge of Jesus. You need to be born again. And from the beginning, which we heard, we have seen with our eyes, and we looked upon him, and we touched him concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and now we've seen it, and we testify to you. We declare to you that we have seen and heard that you also might have fellowship with us. They want intimate knowledge, intimate knowledge. All right? The second revelation was, what did he say to Peter? Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. A revelation of the Father is a second key ingredient to the church because you are called children of God. There was the children of Israel. There was children. You can't understand the concept of being a child unless you know the father. So revelation of the father. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father. The third element. Simon. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this. I call you Peter, a stone, a rock. I'm calling you to a name change. Simon is like a reed that bends in the wind. A rock is solid. Even if it's a small stone, it's still rock. And the key here, the third element of understanding church, ecclesia, corporate, is the name change. When you've really had a name change and you say, I am born again. I am a Christian by experience, not in name only. By experience, I've had a nature change and that is evidence of an tra internal transaction that took place when I got born again. Not religion, not just going to church, but a born again transaction. I have the nature of the Father in, therefore there was a nature change in me. As a matter of fact, if a truly born again person, people should see the change. <laughs> now, the fourth element was, I will build my ecclesia. I will build my corporate body. Messiah is the head, Savior of the church, which is his body. We, though being many, are one body and Messiah and individually members of one another. That needs to be a reality, not theory. A crowd is not necessarily a family. A crowd is not necessarily an ecclesia. Ecclesias are coming together in a, in a corporate setting to where it says, though we are many, are one body and Messiah and individually members of one another. There are people who have no concept of relating to another Christian. And yet, they call themselves Christians. If you isolate yourself, you just want what you want. Well, if, if I reveal who I really am, they'll, they won't like me. Uh, is, is, where is that in the scriptures that you are unliked when he said, from before you were formed in your mother's womb? I want to reveal my son in you. Why don't you concentrate on revealing my son in you instead of hiding? As Dr. Phil used to say, is it, how's that working for you? You know, how's hiding working for you? It's not working. How about being on your own, having your own opinion? Of course, you could always blame the church. That's the devil's best tactic. I got hurt in the church. Well, you know what? It's the wool of sheep that even heals shepherds. <laughs> you, you, we need one another whether we like it or not. 
It's time that we start liking it. <laughs> now, I will build my corporate church. And there's a benefit to that. The fifth element is, is that, and God doesn't build with wood, hay, and stubble, does he? We've covered that. He builds with what's real in you. What's real in me can be what's real in you, and that real reality begins to form a knitting, or what the Bible calls bonds of peace, ligaments, as Jennifer taught. Ligaments. You need ligaments. You're not an arm flopping around on a on pleasant road. You're to be attached. But oh, you might be a really good arm. <laughs> But it looks kind of foolish when it's not attached. It's not part of anything. Now, the other part, the fifth element, is not only is he building his church, but the fifth element is the gates of hell will not prevail. I'm telling you there's a safety in the corporate setting that I wonder, just the, the, the wonderful one accord we have here and we've experienced in this church, I just wonder how much we were saved from and protected from because of our oneness. How many good reports did we receive because of the favor of God whose face smiled upon a people who longed for relationship with him and with one another. You can't just say, I love God. It's these people I can't handle. <laughs> That's a contradiction. It's love God. The two commandments are love God and love one another. Love your differences even. But God says the gates of hell will not prevail. And when we traveled, a lot of times God would pull that, that truth out and we would teach and break just that truth down over and over again. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church, the ecclesia. We had, we had to teach jurisdiction. I memorized this by Jada, J-A-D-A because it became a life principle that I saw when ministering to church fellowships or flocks, they needed an understanding of these four principles. One, jurisdiction. Try to operate outside of your jurisdiction. You don't run somebody else's jurisdiction. You're not under God's authority. God's authority gives you jurisdiction. It's your house, your family. You don't keep your nose out of somebody else's family unless you're invited. <laughs> jurisdiction. Adjudication is to rule, but true Christianity is being under rule. Let the peace of God rule, let God rule, then you're adjudicating. You can't adjudicate in my name. People are using it like a rabbit's foot. If you're not under that authority and his nature, then what you say has no power. But what happens when you do have power? You know what takes place? And we've seen it here. Displacement. You push back the powers of darkness and you make a way for love. Displacement is true spiritual victory. Spiritual victory is not yelling at the dark. True spiritual victory is displacement. It's when God's presence comes in and rules in, a, in an area where the enemy has in the past. And that's why we're praying corporately as a church. And the next step... J, jurisdiction. A, adjudication. D, displacement. A, you advance. You move forward and upward. Victory to victory, glory to glory. Advancement is guaranteed. But you can't, you know, like a riser in a step, that riser is a challenge. When you obey God, you get up onto the next step in your position, and you go step forward, forward, glory to glory. You need to face the riser with obedience to God and his initiative, and you get to the next level. I used to get a kick out of church. I was always talking about, we're at another level. We're at another level. But they would never explain it to me. Oh, whoa, how to, show me how that works. And what are you comparing it to? You know. But God's saying, I want to see. I'm comparing it to change lives. I used to be like this, and now I'm this. This sixth element. He says the gates of hell will not prevail. And he says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. The things you open will be open to God. The things you shut, 
is to shut hell. And the Lord gave me this when I first saw this under the church, the ecclesia, open to God, permit and forbid. I saw keys walking. And it was a vision that was so real, I'll never forget it. He showed me people keys. People that were in the church are going to be keys. But they're keys walking, and they have the ability to open and to shut. Shut the devil out and open the doors to the godly. And that if they come together, these keys walking are going to learn to live a moment-by-moment relationship and every moment is going to be an opportunity for them to use either open or shut, open or shut. Every moment is an opportunity. It's kind of like you choose. It's an opportunity to choose. Every moment is a seed to sow either good or evil, right? Every moment. You don't have to wait for some kind of big ministry or some big project to do. Every moment gives you an opportunity to sow. Make the most of the time because the days are evil. And the seventh element is the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That seventh element, church will impact the world. It, scripture says, not because you preach to them, but because by your love they will believe that the world would believe. They need to see demonstration. It's not the kingdom of God being preached as much as the kingdom of God being demonstrated throughout all the world. Then the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the water covers the sea. We need more demonstration, less lip service. And uh, the devil's always had a plan uh, to block unity. And I see the church's main thing. Church is corporate. The whole thing you're talking about here is yes, your individual members but just one body, it's corporate, corporate, corporate. And we don't have a quality mindset for that sometimes. But the division is the devil's plan. Let us consider and give attention, continuous care for one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another as much more you see the day approaching. And uh, this last week, uh, Wanna, seems like ending it on a negative note, but I'm not done yet anyway. So I'll give the negative note now. This scripture keeps coming up. Remember what Amalek did when you were on the way and you came forth out of Egypt? Remember when they are in the wilderness? They got delivered from Egypt, but how he didn't fear God. But when you were faint, weary, he attacked you along the way and cut off all the stragglers at your rear. Beautiful strategy. Get somebody say, I know God told me and won't listen to anybody. I know God said, they don't want to know whether that's true or not. They want what they want and they want it now. But this thing is, to me, is of concern. Stragglers get picked off. That strategy's not complicated, is it? He, the Amalek did not attack the whole of Israel. There was a protection, but stragglers. Pff, we, I can tell them something. They'll go off on a tangent on some wacko concept, and then I'll take them down. Stragglers can get taken down easily. Now, I want to close on a positive note now. <laughs> and I'm picking up from where Jennifer, you need to hear Jennifer's message. But something I never saw before. I saw what God was doing with me that I might know him. I saw how I, from before I was born in my mother's womb, I was called, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the main thing of Jesus was his prayer for his church, his corporate. And the unity in the Zoe life of the Father, that they might be one as we are one. Now he's a shepherd and he's a king. And one of the things that stood out in John 17 is Jesus prayed for his church, Ecclesia. 
as he prayed for his church, he prayed that they would be one as he was one, at the, like the oneness in the Godhead. Oh, I pray that they would be one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your nature. I kept them in your name. Those you gave me, I kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. What was significant about Judas compared to the other ones? He had his own idea. How Israel ought to win, how to do it by sword, and you know, this Jesus. I got a better idea than Jesus. Doing it Jesus' way is not going to accomplish what I want. But the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So there's a joy in the church that takes place in corporateness that you won't find just individually. But it's for you individually. The second aspect in John 17 was that they all would be one, Father, as you are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world might believe. There's the gospel, that the world might believe. The world's got to see corporate health. They've got to see an entity that is called church. And it's not just a Joe Heavy speaker or someone who's really walking good with the Lord. That's not going to win the world. He needs to see a people who were not a people who became a people. And lastly, the unity. God says, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are. I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. And you know, Jesus loves you as much. God loves you as much as he loved Jesus. That's a hard pill to swallow for people with issues. But you know what? That's the truth. Don't you want to know that love? Don't you want to experience that love? He loved you as much as he loved Jesus. Oh, but if he really knew me. He knows you. <laughs> you can, where are you going to hide? He already knows you. He knows all the garbage. What he wants you to do is to get the blood of Jesus to cleanse the garbage and draw closer to him and accept the love that he's got for you. So, Father, we just praise you and we thank you that we're seated together with you in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we're thanking you that, that in that main, the main thing in Jesus' prayer for his church, it was interesting that I saw safety emerged a, a, a lot out of that, the opposite of what Amalek did with stragglers. And we need to pray for those stragglers, that God would take cords of love and just woo them in. You can't make them do anything, but you can certainly pray. They didn't pray for me. I was too hard of a case. But somehow God drew me in. Somebody must have prayed somewhere and said, oh, even Dennis, Lord, we, we even pray for him. <laughs> uh, hey, it took. I'm so good. <laughs> Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we close now just interceding for the, for the stragglers that be drawn with cords of love into the body of Christ to be loved upon, but to be protected and kept safe. Just as you kept them out of the world. You say, I don't want to take them out of the world, but I want them in the world, but kept safe in the world. Keep them from the evil one. He wants to keep us from the evil one. And so we say yes and amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.